Well, hello, everyone. Um, good to see you again. Hopefully, you can have this video at your own time. So I'm going to present to you um, the gravity part of the geophysical introduction uh, to you all. So this is, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so this is the module that F3, which is geology and geophysics, you have had um, the geology from Hanif and I'm going to deliver the geophysics, uh, which is going to be gravity, um, magnetic and seismic survey. So the first one we need to know basically is uh, the physics review. So I think I have explained this in our physics class. So basically, uh, when we are dealing with physics, we always deal with Newton's law of gravity, especially because we are dealing with gravitational acceleration in here. So the gravitational acceleration on Earth is G equals to the big G, the capital G, which is the gravitational constant, times the mass of the object uh, over the square of the distance uh, to the center of the mass. And the center of the mass, it really depends on what mass you're dealing with. It could be the mass of the Earth, it could be the mass of the object that you're actually observing, etc. And if you don't know the mass, you uh, can actually calculate it by uh, having the density of the object and the volume of the object. So this very simple formula will give you the gravitational acceleration that you need. So the G itself, basically, this is Earth and this is your object. So if the object is buried in the depth of R, for example, you will have this kind of gravity signal. And then if the same object with the same density, with the same volume, buried with an R that is bigger, then you will have the signal that is uh, less than the signal that is uh, in the original. And uh, on the other way, when you have uh, the same volume of object, but with more density, you will have, um, yeah, buried in the same distance, you will have actually a bigger signal. So you will have a stronger signal. And then if you've got the same object with the same volume, but less density and the same R in here, you will actually have less signal. And it is interesting to see that this signal is very similar to this signal. So an object with different depth and different density could be pictured the same way from the gravity. So that's how gravity is actually quite ambiguous. So basically gravity will lead you on the, like um, on a very, very um, beginning process. So you, you enter it with gravity and magnetic first, and then you can pick where you wanna do the seismic afterwards. That's basically uh, the idea of having gravity and magnetic surveys because it covers bigger area than seismic. And yes, those are the Gs or the gravitational acceleration. So this is the quiz. Uh, imagine that the earth is a non-rotating sphere. The key here is a non-rotating sphere with an average density of 5.5 gram per centimeter cubes and radius of 6,370 kilometers. What is the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the earth? So this quiz, I'm going to put it in one assignment page. So don't bother to do it right now, but uh, there are two hints in here. The first hint is to see this you need to see this page, you need to understand the equation, and then you will be able to input this data and get the surface of the, uh, the gravity at the surface of the earth. And then the other one is to know um, the volume of the earth. How do you calculate the volume of the earth, which is here is a non-rotating sphere. So you need to know how you calculate um, the volume of, of a sphere. Okay, so that's the key. and. Of course, you need to take a look at the unit because the units in here are, are not in SI units. So it's not gram, it's kilogram. It's not centimeter or kilometer. It's going to be in meter. And if we are talking about acceleration due to gravity, which is gravitational acceleration, that is going to be here in meter per second squared. That's your answer uh, is supposed to be, okay? 
So that's about the quiz. And when we understand the physics, we will have a look at the instruments. So the instrument look like this. It's a gravimeter. That's how you called it, uh, mounted in a gimbal table with gyros. Um, I don't know if some of you have uh, seen this. So basically, the gravimeter is this one. And this is the gimbal table. So this bit is going to be moving. Uh, and the gravimeter will actually catch it. So this one is uh, from Morris Tyvee um, on, a, on uh, my cruise last year. So apparently he took this photo, <laughs> so great. And everything is attached. And um, so it's not moving anywhere. The gimbal system is not moving everywhere and the computer is installed on top of it. So every single day, um, the geophysicist will take the data and then afterwards we'll process it on board. So gravimeter mounted uh, in a gimbal table with gyros. Um, and then I need to um, emphasize about this, that gravimeter needs a lot of corrections. And the correction comes from where? From the GPS. So for the people who are doing the gravity gravimeter geophysics, they will not only get data from the gravimeter itself, which is going to be the timestamp T and the G, which is the gravitational acceleration, but also you will have the data from the GPS. Again, you will need the timestamp because you will need to have it at the same time. And then the X and the Y or the longitude latitude and the COG and the SOG. Why do we need all this data? Um, oh yeah, sometimes the gravimeter is not directly G. So there's a lot of work to actually get the G. So finally, you will have kind of a table with X, Y, G, C, O, G, and S, O, G. The course over ground, which is basically the heading or the bearing, and the speed over ground, which is the velocity. So the first correction that uh, the geophysicist need is the lever arms. So I think you're familiar with the offsets. So he needs to know where the GPS antenna is and where your uh, graph meter is. And then afterwards, he will have every single uh, thing um, at that time and where it is and what the gravity is. So that's basically what you need to correct uh, the first time. And the second one was absolute gravity. So before you do any gravity surveys, you normally do an absolute gravity measurement. Uh, so you will have the measurement near a benchmark on the dock. And you need to know the gra absolute gravity before your survey and after your survey. Why? Because every single gravimeter have kind of um, an error that is called a drift error. So the even even though for example it's measuring the same gravity it will have a very very little drift it's a very very gentle drift but basically the gravity will be more and more and more and more because gravimeter is based on a, a kind of um um a string not a string something a coil yeah a coil so the coil will be uh you know because it will be expanding and then it will be compressed, expand, compress, expand, something like that. And uh, over the time, it will be expanded more and more. So that's why you need to have an absolute gravity um, correction every single time. You need to know the drift. And afterwards, you will have the vertical acceleration, which is this. So that's basically your heat, right? So we need to know the vertical acceleration along the way. And then there's an ADVOS. So ADVOS uh, correction is basically uh, the attitude of the ship itself in which we know from the COG and SOG. So that's the use of COG and SOG for the gravity meter. Uh, that's for ADVOS correction. So where it is heading and if the speed is affecting um, the attitude and something like that. And we need to know also where we are because um, we need to know the general uh, gravity signatures in the area. And we need to take out that gravity, that big gravity signature, because what we want to know is the anomaly. And finally, we will have a free air anomaly, so-called free air anomaly. Um, and the, the easiest way to explain free air anomaly is basically the anomaly that you observe uh, over uh, 
uh, the sea surface, okay? So all of this correction will be um, delivered in something that is called free air anomaly. Sometimes even the geophysicists will still need to apply filters to actually get FAA or free air anomaly. So I'm delivering you this, all this, because you need to basically give them the best data possible, the gravimeter and the GPS data, okay? So after uh, understanding the basic principles of that and how we measure it with what kind of instrument, we need to know the use of this free air anomaly. So there are actually two types of anomaly that we are going to discuss today. The first one is free air anomaly, and the second one is Bouguer anomaly. So before we speak about free air anomaly and Bouguer anomaly, we will start with bathymetry because uh, I think I, I said this in the class a little bit when I was talking with Mr. Saji and uh, Mr. Gobi. So when you're doing gravity survey, you need to get um, bathymetry survey as well, because otherwise, you will, you know, your data would be useless. You need bathymetry with gravity data. Otherwise, yeah, well, it's it's a shame, you know. So the first one is going to be the bathymetry. This is the um, uh, Mediterranean Sea. You can see that this part is deeper. This part is also deep. This one is a bit shallower. This is very shallow. This is a bit deeper and this is very shallow. That's what you see. But what, act, what you're actually seeing is the sediment that is on top. So the, mm, the advantage of gravity survey is actually you can see the basement rock, something like that. So when you're looking at the free air anomaly, you're not only looking at the sediment that is on top, but actually the total of the gravity attraction um, on that area. So you can see that, okay, this is very, very, Mm, it looks very, very shallow because it's got a very, very high gravity anomaly and it matches with what we have. But if we compare this color with that one, why is it very different? Why is this lower than that one? While in the bathymetry, it looks similar. So maybe the basement rock in this area is deeper than the basement rock in that area. Also, this area seems to be very, very deep while this one is actually a bit shallow. This bit looks very deep, but here it's actually a bit shallow. So the use of the free air anomaly is actually to mimic the basement rock morphology. So you can imagine that uh, because you, you, you are doing the sensor from the sea surface, you are sensing everything from the sea surface and then you have the crust and then, well, actually not the crust, you have the sediment and then you have the crust. So that's basically the general idea of free air anomaly. Now, if we move to the Bouguer anomaly, Bouguer anomaly is actually when you're measuring the rock from the bottom of the earth, um, the bottom of the sea. So you're on the sea floor and you're actually um, observing what is below that. So you can imagine that you're um, you know, on the seafloor of this area, and you can sense that, oh, there's, there, there's a lot of um, gravity anomaly in here. There's a very high anomaly. And you can say that maybe it's very, very high because uh, it's close to the mantle or something like that. Um, and then this area is also very high because it's, uh, maybe it's close to, closer to the mantle. So you have thinner crust. While in this area, you're actually, um, quite far from the mantle because the signal is very, very, um, very, very low. So how do we actually calculate Bouguer anomaly? So again, I'm just going to compare the BA with the FAA. So at the free air here is very, very low. So basically maybe um, the basement rock is very, very deep in there. And it's, uh, it's also deep in here. So maybe uh, that's actually a very, very thick crust while in here, the basement is quite shallow and the thickness of the crust is not that big as well because it looks very, very shallow in here. So maybe it's just that thick. So how do we calculate BA or Bouguer anomaly? So I think I'm going to um, explain to you how you actually sense uh, the seabed based on gravity signatures. So if you're on a boat with 
the graphimeter, which is situated somewhere closest to the COG, as we have discussed in the physics class. So this is your free air signal is going to be. It's going to kind of mimic the seabed, and it's going to a bit exaggerate what it's seeing, what it's looking at. So that's why I told you gravity is very, very, um, it's very sensitive. If you move it, it will, you know, it will make the signal, um, you know, there's a lot of noises. So that's free air normally, simply you're measuring from the sea surface and you're actually measuring the density difference between the crust and the uh, water layer. So if you want to calculate the bouguette anomaly, you need to go down, as I told you. So instead of measuring it from the sea surface, you're actually measuring it from the seabed. That's why you will need bathymetry, as I told you. So you need the bathymetry depth to correct the free air into bouguette anomaly. So the bouguette anomaly, as I told you, you're basically walking down uh, the seabed and you will actually picture the moho. The moho itself is basically the boundary between the crust and the mantle. So the thickness of the crust in the oceanic crust is about like six kilometers, but there's also undulations in there. So basically it's trying to picture the moho when we're going to Buge anomaly. It's trying to picture what is beneath the seabed. And the simple Bouguet anomaly um, equation is this bit. So you have your free air anomaly where it could be in grid, it could be in um, tax, it could be in ASCII or ASCII. And then you just subtract it with this bit. So you know two, you know pi and you know G. G is the one, uh, the gravitational constant that we have talked before. And the number of 2 pi g is actually 0 0.04191. And you need to know the delta of the density, which is this one minus that one, and your h or your height. The height is in meters. And uniquely, your density needs to be in gram per uh, cc. So h is going to be negative because we're having it in bathymetry. So you need to have it in negative value, so which is like minus 3,000 meters, minus 2,000 meters, or if it's shallow, it could be minus 100, minus 500, etc. And uh, here, if you're doing from sea surface to seabed, then this is the delta, um, the delta rho or the de delta of the um, density that you will need. So that's it. Um, lastly, gravity model. So there's a gravity model actually in one minute resolution, which is one mile. It's not very good, but it's good for big structures. It's not good for like small structures or if you want to see, um, you know, a very, very detailed version. But one minute is actually quite good for tectonics purposes in which when we were talking about tectonics, we we're talking about big stuff. So I think Hanif had told you how to uh, see uh, mid oceanic ridges and transform faults in here. So before I actually talk to you about this, uh, imagine that this one is actually South America. As you can see, this part is South of Africa. And then you can see that in the middle in here, you've got the mid oceanic ridge. And the other one that you can see are transform faults. Okay, this is mid oceanic ridge. You can see transform faults. There are cracks in the middle. And we can trace it. And those are the, tra the transform fault uh, at the sea. And you can also see other uh, things like this bit. These are volcanic islands. These are also volcanic islands. You can see that they're actually going sideways, something like that. And there's a lot uh, of things to see from the gravity, basically. And it is available in this. Um, um, in this link. And I, uh, I don't know if we're going to talk about that more, but basically it's there if you want to have a look at it. Uh, it was published in 2014, so it's quite recent actually. So that's it for the gravity part. I'm going to talk to you about magnetic very, very soon. If you have any questions, just let me know.